Izzy Wood is a 30-year-old artist and musician in London. She paints a range of objects, cars, clocks, and details of human figures. Teeth are a favorite, and often works on velvet. Her art has a febrile air of detachment. In early 2020, she had a show at a small gallery in New York, which Loic Gauzer, the former Christie's executive, attended. Larry needs your number, he told her afterward. Gagosian was interested in her work and arranged to visit her studio in East London. It was bizarre, Wood told me. This was the guy that, for better or for worse, built the world that I live in as a young artist, and especially as a young painter, and he wanted to come to my disgusting studio. When he arrived, he moved quietly among the works and didn't say much. He was shopping, Wood said, like it was Harrod's. Gagosian started buying her paintings and displaying them at his home in New York. Top collectors, as attentive as stock pickers to his tastes, noticed, and suddenly her paintings were selling on the secondary market for more than a quarter of a million dollars. I could feel the hotness of Larry having approved my work, she recalled. She attributes a surge, in part, to prospectors having heard that she might soon be joining Gagosian, which would drive her prices higher still. It was insider trading, she said sardonically. It's an industry with no rules. She met with Gagosian a few more times, including at the Ritz in Paris. Wood, who is sober, was put off when he urged her to drink and take ketamine. He says that he was aware of Wood's sobriety and would never make such a suggestion, and denied that he takes ketamine himself. Gagosian told Wood that he wanted to mount a show of her work, it was unnerving to be on the receiving end of a charm offensive from someone who has kind of transcended having to charm, she observed. It felt like a necessary inconvenience to him. She was still procrastinating over whether to commit to a show when the pandemic began. Gagosian seems to hate being alone, and now his famous ability to convene was curtailed. He spent much of the lockdown in Amagansett. Tico Mugrabi and his wife stayed in the guest house, and he told me that even at the height of the pandemic, Larry never stopped thinking about business. Gagosian started texting Wood, who was alone in London and feeling isolated herself, and calling her often multiple times a day. She came to savor these exchanges, and gradually they developed a bond. I loved speaking to Larry, she said. To talk to him was to be in touch with an era I was never a part of, these stories he would tell with varying degrees of lucidity. She sent him photographs of works in progress, which he greeted with his standard, nearly monosyllabic affirmations, responding to a painting of a faucet. I love faucets. Even so, he had amazing taste, she thought, and he could be very funny, and she admired the fact that he was not some to the manner born dandy. He was also really vulnerable, I think, she continued. He's an extrovert, and I think he was very bored. Once travel restrictions eased, Wood visited New York. Gagosian offered to throw her a party and suggested that she invite a bunch of friends. After she produced a provisional guest list, one of his assistants informed her that, apart from the music producer Mark Ronson, Gagosian didn't recognize the names. Wood felt a momentary flush of embarrassment that her friends weren't more famous. Gagosian, the assistant wrote, was happy to host them, but would like a little background to familiarize himself. So Wood supplied him with bios. Gagosian's townhouse, decorated in the sterile fashion of today's super-rich, resembles an event space in an exceedingly nice hotel. Zero clutter, few personal effects. The party's guest list ended up being a combination of his friends and Wood's, it was the first in-person celebration many of them had been to since the pandemic began, and the mood was energetic. I got a little taste of what it would be like to be a Gagosian artist, Wood recalled. It was very comforting to be around someone who is having that good a time all of the time. Wayant was there. Eddie the butler served food. Everyone smoked indoors. Liechtenstein, Mondrian, Picasso. Warhol's triple Elvis over the fireplace. Larry would keep insisting that I loosen up, Wood recalled. He's like an old guy, and he had some crumbs down his shirt, and he got so drunk and was making less and less sense, 
and was screaming at his staff to play Aerosmith. She paused. I wasn't thinking, I hope this is my life. Gagosian denies that he was drunk or requested Aerosmith. Afterward, Gagosian and Wood continued to discuss the idea of her joining the gallery, but her reservations were intensifying. Maybe he's good at speaking to artists once they're rich, she said, but I've never seen him do a really good job building a career from the ground up. The matter came to a head when the two met again at his townhouse. They sat at an oversized table. An Olympic swimming event played on a silent TV. Wood wanted to know about the gallery's long-term future, so she asked, What will happen when you die? What the fuck is wrong with you? Gagosian exploded. Talking about my death when we're trying to have a meeting. Wood now concedes that this wasn't very diplomatic. But she wanted an answer, and she was pissed at him. Gagosian told Wood that he wasn't going anywhere. It may have been that he was succumbing to an affliction that is common among megalomaniacal plutocrats, an inability to imagine a world in which he no longer exists. His friend Diego Maraquin told me that he once proposed that Gagosian sell his building in Chelsea and lease back the ground floor gallery. Gagosian said that if he did so, he'd insist on a fifty-year lease. I said, Larry, it doesn't work. You're not going to be around. Gagosian protested to Wood, I'm in the best shape of my life. No one understands your work like I do. I want to make you a star. When she wasn't won over by this line of argument, he pivoted, saying, I've done so much for you. He mentioned that he'd bought her work, he owns about ten pieces, and displayed it in his house. As Gagosian was raising his voice, Wood noticed that Eddie had tactfully exited the room. Eventually she excused herself to go to the bathroom. She sat on the edge of the toilet, staring at the room's elegant marble design, in no hurry to return. Then her phone lit up with a text from Gagosian, and then another, and then another. He had sent the same text three times. By accident, she thinks. The other galleries you are considering will most likely go out of business before my demise. When Wood came out of the bathroom, Eddie informed her that Gagosian had gone to take a nap. She left the townhouse and ended up joining a smaller gallery, Michael Werner. I think she's a talented woman, Gagosian told me. Why she went sideways like that, I have no idea. He seemed genuinely hurt and exasperated, and wondered aloud why she would bite the hand that feeds her. But he repeated several times that she is a good painter. In Amagansett, before I ever broached the subject of wood, Gagosian had shown me a small canvas of two Marilyn Monroes that she had painted, and said, proudly, A friend of mine gave me this, as a gift.' 